Uh, Brett and Jessica have all obviously been through a hard time um, themselves this past year. Uh, they lost a child earlier this year, and Brett got to go down to Mexico to comfort a family that was going through their own loss. While they were down there in Mexico, uh, the family's grandmother passed away while they were down there. And uh, the people of Rooftop who have themselves gone through an awful lot this past year got to be by their side, pay for the funeral expenses, and just comfort them uh, through a terrible time. And what a great opportunity, what a blessing, uh, to be there at the same time. What a terrible thing, but what a great opportunity all the same. So we're going again in a couple months, and if you don't want to wait 352 days uh, and you want to go in 60-ish, uh, come stick around after this service right here and get the details. And uh, if you don't, it's no commitment, just come and get information. And I'm sure that you'll have lots of great stories and experiences to tell. So let's go ahead and pray uh, for that meeting and for that upcoming trip, and then we'll continue on with the service. Father, I thank you uh, on Brett's behalf and on behalf of the entire team and on behalf of our church for uh, the blessing uh, that you give and the sacrifice and uh, the love that you uh, shed upon your people as we take, out, take steps in faith towards you in service to other people. Thank you for keeping everybody uh, safe down in Mexico, but um, forging some relationships and some friendships that will, um, that are incredibly meaningful and will last a long time. I pray for the upcoming trip and for the meeting that you draw people to it to continue using us to do your great work. Be with us this morning as we study your word and uh, aspire to step in your steps as we move forward in faith. Amen. Well, when Michelle, my wife, and the boys and I went to Guatemala several years ago, we wanted to go visit the ancient Guatemalan village of Antigua. Antigua is an old scenic town. It's surrounded by three volcanoes in the middle of Guatemala. It contains centuries-old Spanish architecture. It's still populated by beautiful Mayan people dressed in beautiful Mayan garb. Uh, even though Antigua is a bit touristy, we still had no idea where anything was let alone what we needed to avoid, so we hired a tour guide named Victor. Victor was a smart, funny, bilingual Guatemalan who knew all the right destinations, he knew all the right scenic views. He took us to the coffee plantation, that's where this uh, picture was taken, he took us to the, I think he's holding up like a coffee plant or something, is that right? Uh, Max remembers the moment, I think he got some photo evidence of it there. Took us to the coffee plantation, took us to the monastery, took us to this great scenic overlook, uh, overlooking Antigua, and then he took us home. I can't imagine getting around Guatemala without Victor. Uh, I'd never been to Guatemala before. I don't know the roads or the language. I would have been robbed or killed. It's the same reason most people going on any expedition do the same thing. They hire a guide. Lewis and Clark needed to go west. They had no idea where they were going. Who did they bring along? Yeah, it's actually pronounced, I learned this this week, it's a Kagawea. Yeah, it's a hard G. The Lemhi Shoshone woman who guided them into the West while carrying her newborn on her back. Remember that. She knew the land, she knew the people, she knew the way. Sir Edmund Hillary wanted to ascend Mount Everest, but had never done that before, so we hired a guide. Anybody know the name of his guide? Tenzing Norgay. Yeah, our, our woodsman over there knows... The name of Tenzing Norgay. <laughs> the local Sherpa Indian who knew the mountain up one side and down the other. When Dante was brought to hell to record all that he saw, he had a guide to take him through hell so he didn't get lost in hell. Wouldn't have been terrible to get lost in hell. Who was Dante's tour guide? Virgil, the poet. Very, who knew that? Kirsten. Yeah, our literary scholar over there. Maybe that was too academic for you, so how about this one? When Billy Crystal needed to drive those cows north <laughs> to Colorado in City Slickers, he needed a guy too. He wasn't a cowboy, couldn't really stay on a horse, had no idea where Colorado was, so he got a tour. Who was his tour guide? Curly, played by Jack Plants, the toughest man who ever lived. When you go somewhere you've never been, you need someone who's been that way before. You need their wisdom, you need their example, you need them to show you the way. Christianity is the same. Being a Christian is not something any of us have done before. This is the first time for many of us. I've never been to heaven before. 
I don't know how to get there. You've never been to heaven before. You don't know how to get there. Besides which, life and faith can be as treacherous as the Wild West. It can be as scary as hell. It can be as unpredictable as Indian country, as foreign as Guatemala. It'd be nice to try to make your own way, to cut your own path, but that'd also be stupid. We need a guide. Someone who's walked these trails, who knows the land, who can get us through and then get us home. Well, like Jeremy said, we are in week two here at Rooftop of a new series called Next Steps, the series. As we explained last week, the series is our attempt to reboot our capital campaign. We're looking for a new building here so we can keep reaching out to St. Louis, keep realizing our potential as a congregation. Here at Rooftop, we believe God has big, important things for us to do. He created us to move and grow and push forward and take big steps, and that's what this series is about, helping ourselves be ready to take that next step when it's time. But the series isn't just about our building search or our capital campaign. It's about walking with God, stepping forward with Him. God didn't just create churches to step forward and move forward. He created people to grow and move, to explore to exercise our spirits, like we talked about last week. If you don't use your body, if you don't move your body, you atrophy and you die. Same thing with our spirits. It's why walking with God is such a popular image in the Bible. People are always walking in Scripture, taking steps with God. So during this series, we're looking at that metaphor in the Bible of stepping forward with God, of just keeping step with God. Last week, we talked about stepping out in faith. Next week, Jeremy's going to talk about stepping with the Spirit, going where the Spirit leads you. A couple weeks, we're going to talk about stepping together. The Bible talks about moving in the same direction at the same time. We're also going to talk about stepping in wisdom, stepping carefully. But this morning, we're going to talk about stepping behind in obedience. Step out, step with, step together, step carefully, and step behind. One of the great things about being a Christian is that we get to follow a guide who knows where he's going and how to get there. This is what it means to be a follower of Christ. Jesus told people about 50 different times in the Gospels to come, follow me. That's why Jesus came to earth, to show us where to go, what to do, how to live. As Peter writes, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. It's what distinguishes Christianity from so many other religions, How many other religions have gods that actually came down to earth to leave us an example and show us how to walk? Jesus did this. As John writes, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Christianity is about obedience. Following in Jesus' steps, walking like he walks, going where he goes. We're like that little kid in that iconic picture hopping in his mother's footsteps in the sand, trying to stay in the footprints just going wherever the footprints go. Unfortunately, following in the steps of Christ isn't as fun or as idyllic as that image suggests. First off, even though Jesus came to earth as our example and shows us where to go and what to do, that doesn't mean he isn't going to take us through some pretty dark periods, some harrowing stages. He'll take us through some deserts. He'll lead us into some valleys, he'll drive us into the fog, he'll take us on some tough climbs, he'll take us on some terrible tragedies. One of my favorite scenes in the life of Jesus is when he and his disciples are following him to Jerusalem. Jesus has explained to them what they're going to find in Jerusalem. He's explained to them that they're going to be persecuted there, he's going to suffer, and then he's going to die. And then he turns around and keeps walking. And Mark records the moment. They were on their way up to Jerusalem, with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished, and those who followed were afraid. I know, it makes me sneeze too. (laughs) Let's all sneeze together. Let me read it one more time. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. The disciples were astonished. Those who followed were afraid. Exactly, thank you. Amen. Imagine the scene. Jesus has explained. Okay, so we get to Jerusalem. We're all going to be persecuted. I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to die. Imagine people like, what are we doing? (laughs) Jesus was going in the wrong direction, into the fire. They all just kind of crept along with fear, not knowing what they were going to find. It's for this reason that a lot of people just don't make the trip. 
because Jesus tends to take people through some pretty scary places. G.K. Chesterton, an old British writer, he said this, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. Following in Jesus' steps is hard, but it's also not popular. Our culture doesn't tend to value conformity and following. We value nonconformity and leadership. We fought for our independence from the Brits to be different because we didn't want to do what our leaders were telling us we had to do. And today our parents and our teachers and leaders and poets don't tell us to be followers, to stay in line, to wait our turn. They tell us to strike out, make our own way in the world. Robert Frost talks about being in the woods and coming upon two paths. One more traveled, one less traveled. Which did he take? The less traveled. How much of a difference did it make? All the difference. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, Do not follow where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path. Make a trail. Now, I actually like those quotes. I like them because they remind me to be independent-minded. But we can be so independent in spirit that we forget what it means to be a Christian. I mean, to be a Christian means to follow someone else's example as close as you can. To live like he lived. To step where he stepped. To go where he went. And I like it this way. I have never been to heaven before. I have no idea how to get there. I have not lived a successful life before. I don't know how to do that. Do you know how to get to heaven? Would you rather strike out on your own path, make your own way, or follow in the footsteps of someone who came to earth, made a way, and invites us to follow? To be a Christian is to walk as Jesus walked. That's what John writes. He says, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. It's one thing to claim to be a Christian, but it's another thing to walk like one, to walk like him. This brings up an important question, though. If John writes... Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. What question does that raise for us? How did Jesus walk? Uh, when I was in college, I took some acting classes, and we did a lot of work on walking. Uh, characters always have very distinct walks, and it's part of the characterization. You've got to figure out how they walk. Have you seen the movie Lincoln yet with Daniel Day-Lewis, directed by Steven Spielberg? Thank you. Some of you have. <clears throat> well, apparently, Day Lewis had w Lincoln's walk down pat. It was this slow, laboring, hunched stride with a slight pigeon toe on the right. And it communicated who Lincoln was. He was thoughtful, deliberate, but awkward. Day Lewis read all sorts of history books to figure out how Lincoln walked because he wanted to communicate who he was. And in my acting class, we actually had to just work on walking, walk like. Yeah, this is my normal walk. <laughs> Who am I? I'm a runway model, see? Can you, you don't, this not obvious? Oh, I need to take more acting classes. All right, here's another walk. Okay, I'll pretend here, my papers. I'm a nerd. That was easy. Okay, one more. It's fun for me. Is it fun for you? Okay, here we go. Yes, a toy soldier. No, a Nazi soldier, yeah. Um, we actually even had to do this exercise in uh, acting class. We had to imitate other people's walks in the classroom. Yeah, it was fun. And the guy who had to imitate my walk, he got up on stage. His name was Rich. Yeah, and he'd been working on my walk all week. So he got up on stage, he tucked his shirt in, pulled his pants up, kind of hunched over a little bit and walked around like this. And I said, that's not my walk. And everybody in the class said, that's your walk. And <laughs> And the professor asked him, so Rich, how did you put together Matt's walk? And he said, well... I pretended that I was a dorky cowboy with self-esteem problems.
Is that what I look like, a dorky cowboy with stall pussy? <laughs> In fact, I've got a lot of back problems now, maybe from my dorky cowboy with self-esteem walk, walking. So I'm trying to walk straight, you know? Um, whenever, uh, and Jeremy makes fun of me at the office because he, whenever I get up and go to the bathroom or get to a drink of water, I'll like walk by the office. <laughs> and sometimes he'll just walk by my office like this. <laughs> To be a Christian, let's, to be a Christian means to walk as Jesus walked, to step as he stepped. We have to study his walk, we have to follow his gait, but how did Jesus walk and how should we? Briskly, slowly, tall and confident? Later in John's letters, John the writer, who said that, anybody who claims to be in Christ must walk as Jesus did, later in John's letters, uh, he actually gets a little bit more specific about the way we are to walk. In the second letter of John, he's describing to his readers the way a Christian should walk, and here's what he writes. He says, It has given me great joy to find some of you walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another, and this is love that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. So here in 2 John, the author makes the same point that we've been making through the, through the series so far, that Christianity is the act of moving, walking, but he also gets rather specific about what it means to walk as Christ. We walk in the truth, that's what he writes, walk in the truth, walk in obedience, and walk in love. That's what it means to walk as Christ, to walk in the truth, to walk in obedience, and to walk in love. And with the time I have left this morning, that's what I'm going to talk about this morning. First off, we are to walk in truth. As John writes, it has given me great joy to find some of you walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. To walk in truth means to live in the knowledge of who God is and who you are, who we are as his children. It means to live differently Knowing what you know about God and yourself. Jesus walked in truth. He lived in the knowledge of who he was as God's son. It gave him courage and confidence. In John 13, for example, John writes that Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Imagine having that sort of conviction. Jesus knew that he was from God and that God had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning from God. Imagine walking around during the day knowing that. Earlier, Jesus says, I know the Father and the Father knows me. Imagine walking about with that sort of confidence that you know God and you know that God knows you. Jesus lived with that sort of confidence. You might say, you might say that Jesus walked with that type of swagger. Do you know what it means to walk with swagger? It means to walk with confidence. I remember when the Rams were really good. There was a day, children, <laughs> when the Rams were really good. It was in recent memory, in fact, about 10 years ago. And I remember watching a game during the height of the greatest show on turf, and I remember John Madden saying, the Rams just walk with swagger. They walk with their arms doing this chin held high, they walked into a building, no, I'm going to win this game because I know that we can. And they did. They knew they were good. They walk in any stadium, win the game. For like four glorious years, the Rams walked with swagger. Then they started stinking. And now they walk with shame. You just see those pictures on the TV and in the newspaper. Swagger isn't cockiness, it's just confidence at what you know about yourself, that you're good. Jesus knew who he was as God's son, and it led him into all sorts of crazy situations, knowing God was going to take care of him. Now, if God's son can walk with that sort of swagger and confidence, can't God's people? If the rams can walk with swagger, can't we? I mean, we are far more victorious 
than they ever were or will be ever again. We have a prize more eternal than the Vince Lombardi trophy. We have a coach more long-lasting than Dick Vermeil. What truth do we know? What truth do we walk in? We know that God is real. We know that he loves us devotedly, that he came to earth to die for our sins, which he did. We know he rose from the dead. We know he left his spirit inside of us. We know we're completely forgiven. We can never fall from his hand. We know death has no power over us. We will live forever with each other, ruling with Christ over creation. Talk about swagger. That's all true, and we believe it. But so many of us, myself including, included, walk around not with swagger, but with shame. We walk around not like the 2,000 rams, but the 2,010 rams. We're afraid of scary situations. We're afraid of big games. We're afraid to run tough plays because we're not walking in the truth. To walk in the truth means to pray big prayers, knowing God has promised to hear you. To walk in the truth is to not be afraid of scary situations because we know that God can get us through them. To walk in truth is to invite other people to church. Come follow. You, come follow. Because we believe in church and that other people need to hear about Jesus. To walk in truth is to stand and worship and raise our hands because we know it's true. Jesus walked in truth. We should also walk in obedience. John says this as well, walk in obedience to his commands. Jesus walked in obedience to the Father, going where he commanded and living as he said. Paul writes in the Philippians, in the book of Philippians, that Jesus came to earth as a man and he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus did what the Father told him to do, no matter what it was or where it led him. To follow Jesus means to have this same spirit of obedience. Jesus says, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. Talk about black and white. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. If he doesn't love me, he won't obey my teaching. There it is. This was a frequent command in the Old Testament, too. Moses told the Israelites in Deuteronomy, for example, he said, you should walk. They were walking back in the Old Testament, too. You should walk in all the ways the Lord your God has commanded you. The word that gets me in that verse there is all. It's a reminder that the challenge isn't to walk in some of the ways that the Lord your God has given you. Because then you just find the ways that are easy for you and ignore the hard ones. I remember several years ago, Pope John Paul II. Remember Pope John Paul II? Do you remember Pope John Paul II? Uh, he was talking to American Catholics about birth control. You know what birth control is? It's when you... Okay, I didn't want to make assumptions. <laughs> Should I explain? Some, there's some confusion over here. About birth control? Sean, you know what birth control is? <laughs> <laughs> well, from a Catholic perspective, I'll move on with the illustration. From a Catholic perspective, birth control is wrong, but most American Catholics ignore that part of their faith. And Pope John Paul was getting a little irritated. Uh, As he said, I remember this speech, he said, Catholicism isn't like a buffet. I loved when I heard him talk like this. It's not like a buffet. Where you can pick and choose what you want to eat, a little bit of this, a little bit of this, none of that, certainly none of that. As he said, you're either a Catholic following the teachings of the church, or you're not. No, I'm not a Catholic. Be clear for the visitors here. I see no problem with birth control. But the point still holds that whatever denomination Christians belong to, we usually treat it like a buffet. I like this, not this. I like this, not this. I love coming to church. I don't like forgiving my enemies. Skip that. I like worshiping God through service. I don't like tithing 10% of my income to God. Skip that. I like praying, but I don't like telling other people about Jesus. Skip that. I like listening to sermons. I don't like working out conflict. Skip that. I like loving my kids. Not too fond of loving my husband. Skip that. We have this pick and choose faith. This, 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 this. But the Bible doesn't tell us to do some of those things. We should walk in 
all the ways that the Lord your God has commanded you. I mean, if you want to follow Christ, you've got to step in every one of those footprints. Otherwise, you get stuck. And he just keeps going. And you're just looking at the next one. Just staring at it. You can't follow Christ like that. The next footprint for you might be really impossibly difficult. But if you want to keep going, you've got to put your foot there. What's a command of Christ's that you've chosen to avoid on the buffet? Love of enemies, submitting to leaders, tithing your money and time, sharing your faith. You really want to be a Christian. We must walk in all the ways Jesus walked, not some of them. There are no partial Christians. We either walk in his ways or we don't. If we want to walk as Jesus walked, we must walk in truth, we must walk in obedience, and lastly, we must walk in love. This is also what John writes. It says, if you, as you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. This is certainly how Jesus walked. Everywhere he went, he felt love and showed love. He was the most loving man to ever walk the earth. One of my favorite scenes from the life of Jesus uh, comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. Jesus meets up with a guy, unfortunately nicknamed the rich young ruler. This guy has some problems. He's proud, he's arrogant. He wants to follow Jesus, but he doesn't want to give up too much. So Jesus and him go back and forth in the conversation a little bit, and then at some point in the conversation, Jesus just stops and looks at him. And the moment is incredible because it's so dramatic and bizarre. Here's what Mark writes in uh, the story. He says, Jesus looked at the man and loved him. I love this moment in the story. It had to be incredibly awkward for everybody. The guy's just talking, and Jesus just doesn't say anything and just looks at him. I'm tr- I've always tried, what, what did that? What was, the look, what was the look of love? And everybody in the audience is like watching the conversation. Like, What's he doing? He's loving him. I don't... <laughs> How long did it last? But I love that it's there. And sometimes I get it. Like one of my kids does something incredibly endearing, and you just look. And that's when they do something lovable. This guy was doing something idiotic. And Jesus just looks at him. Oh, gosh, I love you so much. Just do it. No matter where Jesus went or what he did, he went in love for everybody he ran into. It was just coming out of his eyeballs. That's that's love coming out of my eyeballs. The Bible tells us to walk the same way. Paul writes in the book of Ephesians, follow God's example. Walk in the way of love. That's how God does it. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, as dearly loved children walk in the way of love just as Jesus did in giving himself up for us. In practical terms, we know what this means. It's not too difficult. It means to forgive people. It means to go out of our way to serve them. It means to encourage them with our words. It means to reach out to people in need. It means to say hi to people at church who look a little nervous. It means to reach out to people who are different than us. It means to help strangers. Jesus did all, did all these things. This is how he lived. This is how he walked. But here's the question. What does this have to do with our Next Steps Capital Campaign? As we're raising money and awareness and looking for buildings, what does it mean for us to walk in love? Does it mean anything? Well, absolutely. It means to remember why we're doing this. We're not doing this for the sake of getting bigger. We're not doing this because raising money is fun. We're doing this because God loves us and St. Louis and the world and needs us to be compelled by that love So it makes some pretty significant sacrifices in the same way that he did for us so that we could experience his love, be changed forever, and live forever with him. We're not doing this for ourselves. I mean, I already have a church home. You have a church home. We could be happy here. But we're doing this because there are millions of people in St. Louis who don't have a church home, and we believe in truth that they can experience the love of God here or wherever 
become Christians here and live forever because of it? Do we love them enough to sacrifice what we need to so that they can have the same chance to live forever as God gave to us? How much would we be willing to sacrifice to give them that opportunity to experience God's love? We've looked at some pretty expensive buildings that are kind of far away. And we've had to talk about that. Do we love them enough to even consider that? How much do we love the people of St. Louis? So how did Jesus walk and how should we? Walked in truth, walked in obedience, walked in love. Wherever life takes us, wherever we go, that's how we go there. In the truth of who we are as God's beloved children, in obedience to all his commands, and in love for others with the same God love has for us. Those are our next steps. It doesn't really matter where we go as long as we go there as he did in truth, obedience, and love. And as you're thinking about those steps Jesus took this morning, ask yourself this question in response time. Which of those steps, which of those strides is the one you don't know how to take? Which of those steps of Jesus, your walking guide, is the one you need to imitate? Stepping in truth, knowing who you are as one of God's children, Stepping in obedience, following all of Christ's commands, even the steps you don't want to take. Stepping in love, loving others enough to sacrifice for them the way God did for you. Think about that step this morning. Think about Christ's example who came to show us how to walk. Consider what it really means to follow Jesus in that way. Then walk in it. Walk as the follower of Christ that you claim to be. Let's pray.